there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The 21st century human body is no longer at the mercy of evolution. Cutting edge science, modern medicine and molecular biology could soon enable us to take evolution into our own hands. Now scientists scour our DNA to save us from diseases that once would have killed us. build vital organs and human tissue out of living cells, and delve deep into our genetic code to engineer the humans of the future. This is the start of a new era, the next stage in the evolution of us. Seven billion of us. Our species has taken over the planet. Millions of years of evolution created the amazing human body that brought us to where we are today. Now advances in science and technology have increased our lifespan significantly. And revolutionary discoveries in human genetics means soon we may be able to control the course of evolution. We're at a period of dramatic discovery in terms of the effects of genes and how the environment too affects our health and our longevity. We can now project some about where our species is going, or at least what are the evolutionary forces that are gonna be affecting our species in the future. Around the world, Scientists are already re-engineering the human body in ways that would have been inconceivable a decade ago. In the United States, Sergeant Ron Strang was one of the first to benefit. In 2010, Strang was a Marine in the US military. So we were on foot patrol in Afghanistan, the town of Marja, the southern Helmand province. Uh, it's a typical day. We're walking down through the village uh, on a street. Without warning, Strang's unit was blown up by a roadside bomb. When I had the IED go off, it went off on my right side. It clipped the muscle and it took it from about halfway up the quad to just below the hip and uh, took all this muscle mass uh, on my leg off. I could see the bone in the middle and uh, the muscle kind of splayed out and just all red. Um, so I knew immediately what had happened. With his left leg blown apart, Strang was told he would never walk again due to the immense loss of tissue. A team at the University of Pittsburgh had already been looking at ways to grow parts of the human body in the lab. Ron's badly damaged leg presented them with a challenge. Can you hold that up? Or? What we're trying to do is fundamentally change the default response to an injury. Our, our muscle on our legs, it's one of the few tissues in the human body that, that can regenerate from minor injuries. However, when you have a more major injury and you lose large amounts of muscle, it exceeds the patient's ability to, to regenerate the muscle. So it needs some help. Strang's leg was too badly damaged for his body to repair naturally, so the Pittsburgh team had to do it for him. They created a kind of scaffold for Strang's muscle cells to grow on. 
made out of animal protein. It's known as an extracellular matrix. Surgeons planted the matrix inside Ron's leg, and when it broke down, it drew new cells to the area. It sends signals to the adjacent healthy tissue that says, instead of simply treating this site as an injury site with inflammation and scar tissue, we should actually rebuild the tissue. From there, Strang's own cells regenerated the muscle. And within weeks, Ron could not only walk correctly, he could even run. Strang's story is just one of the ways we're starting to reshape the human body. The Pittsburgh team's pioneering work is at the forefront of a bold new field of medicine. From robotic hands that know what we're thinking, to man-made hearts that beat on their own. We're designing the bodies of the future and starting to dictate the way humans may evolve. But our rapid progress in science and medicine is affecting the course of human evolution in more ways than one. The fast-changing world about us is increasingly out of sync with the slow process of natural selection that drives evolution. The environment in which we now live has changed more in the past few centuries than at any other time in the history of humankind. It all started with the Industrial Revolution. Throughout the 19th century, the age of invention swept across much of the world. It marked the beginning of the modern era and a new way of living. When we look at the future, it's not about what we can invent. It's about what people choose to do with those inventions. With its move towards machines and factories, the Industrial Revolution changed the way we work and play, travel, eat, and even think. The great innovators of that time also gave us possibilities we'd never encountered before. We do things today culturally that were not possible in the past. In our past, we're limited because our technology doesn't allow us to alter ourselves. Today, we can create changes that will be inherited by future generations. The world we live in today is unrecognizable from the one in which our ancestors evolved. I can get up in the morning and I can spend my entire day without ever elevating my heart rate. I can take the elevator up to my office. I can sit in a chair all day long, staring into my computer. I never have to do anything. Uh, that's one of the effects of the Industrial Revolution. There are few people left in the world who live unaffected by the Industrial Revolution. But for those who do, its impact on the human body is remarkable. In northern Mexico, high volcanic plateaus cut by deep gorges form one of the most extreme landscapes on Earth. This is the Copper Canyon, and it's home to the Taramara people, known as the light-footed ones. Against a backdrop of breathtaking grandeur, the Taramara make light work of the near-vertical copper-colored canyon walls. They run along narrow footpaths at dizzying heights for hours at a time. The fit, lean bodies of these remarkable runners are maintained by an environment that exploits the best in their genes. You have to be fit to survive here. The canyons are deeper than the Grand Canyon and the deepest is more than one mile deep and it's very steep. 
in order to live in those mountains, you need to be able to master the mountains from a physical point of view. But if the Taramara leave their traditional environment and step into the modern world, they face disastrous consequences. In the big city, I can tell you they're nothing in terms of their health uh, like the Taramara who live uh, in the Copper Canyons. The shocking transformation is an extreme example of a problem that faces many of us as we move further away from the environments in which the first humans evolved. The Taramara aren't special. What's special about us is that we're abnormal. We grow up sedentary, inactive. We wear shoes most of our lives. All of those things change our bodies and, and make us the weird ones. The Taramara are the normal ones. Through human evolution, the genes that have helped us store fat have been highly advantageous. Human beings are actually, compared to other primates, very fat animals. And the reason we're fat, and we evolved to be fat, is that fat is, plays an important role in our reproductive biology. For many in the developed world, an endless supply of food arrives on a plate. Human evolution took place over millions of years, and for most of this time we had to work hard to get even small amounts of food. So the process of natural selection favored genetic mutations that would help us store energy from the little food we could find. But we never evolved to live in, in environments where we had an excess of energy. Taking any excess energy we have and storing it as fat for, for when we need it. Everything about our bodies are a result of an interaction between your genes and your environment. The mutations that helped early humans through times of scarcity cause metabolic diseases today. When we look at ancient humans, they never had type 2 diabetes. It was something that could never occur in an ancient population because the surplus of food was not there. Genes that worked well in our Stone Age world are out of alignment or mismatched with the way we live today. A mismatch disease is a disease that's caused by a mismatch between our genes and our environment. There's lots of mismatch diseases which continue to occur. Our history has left us this vulnerability, and it will increase in the future because the westernization of diet is happening everywhere. The United States now is fatter than any other country in the world, but everyone else is going our direction. The rate of evolutionary change does not happen fast enough for our prehistoric genes to adapt. Nowhere is this more apparent than among the Taramara of Mexico. In their canyon wall settlements, the traditional Taramara live on a simple diet. They grind corn to make thick tortillas and a roasted corn powder known as pinoli. Although the copper canyons can be very hot in the summer, Freezing winters mean food may be scarce, so genes that help store fat become an advantage. If you did not have that ability to store fat for those lean times, then you would die. So they actually need those genetic traits in order to survive. Few roads reach here, and for many centuries the Taramara have lived with a near vertical transportation network. In their downtime, the Taramara compete in a staggeringly long traditional race. Springing up vertical ascents, the Taramara knock spots off ultra-fit visitors who struggle to keep up. These Taramara are still making good use of genetic mutations that date back to our earliest ancestors. But as soon as they leave, problems emerge. Many Taramara move away from the canyons and into cities like Chihuahua. When they move off the mountains, their genetics start to work against them. 
and they face serious health issues. Those who have become urbanized and those who are living a life of abundance, for them today, what was once a, a way of surviving has now become a way of, of becoming sick. Dr. Jesus Arguias sees the downsides of the Taramara's genetic inheritance firsthand. The main cause of death among these people with obesity is diabetes. In fact, the correlation is so strong that the term diabetes has been coined to describe it. Martin Castillo is a Taramara man who struggles in a modern environment. When Martin first came, he had several problems, one of which is that he is insulin resistant, which means he was already in the early stages of diabetes. If he doesn't stop eating fats and sugars, his condition will worsen and eventually kill him. The problem affects not just the Taramara, but the whole of the country. Mexico is the second most obese country in the world. Mexicans seem to have a genetic predisposition towards obesity, and the environment, their diet and other genetic factors make this even worse. Mismatched diseases are not the only way in which the Industrial Revolution influenced the evolution of us. Medical science is trying to come to terms with the diabetes epidemic. But for many diseases, discoveries in the world of medicine have already saved millions of lives. In 1862, the French chemist Louis Pasteur conducted an experiment that would change the course of human history. At that time, no one truly knew how diseases spread and epidemics claimed millions of lives. Pasteur proved that disease was spread by germs and viruses. His discovery led to the use of vaccinations, which have been saving countless lives ever since. This is the success of 19th century medicine, is that an enormous amount more people survived than would have done in the past. Over the next century, the great pioneers of modern medicine continued to find ways to combat disease, helping our species to reach 7 billion today. This rapid rise in population is now thought to be affecting the way we are currently evolving. At the University of Wisconsin, Professor John Hawkes studies recent human evolution and the modern day effects of natural selection. Darwin actually predicted that when you had more individuals, more people, you would have more mutations and more chances of selection. And so the number of people that we have has actually increased the potential for change. Tiny variations called mutations occur as our cells divide. When we pass these on to our offspring, they can bring about change. So could the mutations in our burgeoning population be causing evolution to speed up? Mutations are, you know, like a roll of the roulette wheel. You can have many bad outcomes, a lot of outcomes that, you know, are not very bad or good, but a few chances of having something very good. Today, scientific understanding of our genes means that we're able to change some of the bad outcomes of mutation. And some believe this could alter the course of human evolution. Many times people worry that technology is letting people survive. And we have many conditions today that you can survive and, and have children, which in the past would have killed you. It seems like the force of natural selection should have stopped. But in reality, over the last 10,000 years, our evolution in that time has actually sped up. It's accelerated. And that's a really interesting discovery that we hadn't suspected before we started to study the genetics. The only way really to understand what was going on was to unravel the contents of our DNA. 
So when the Human Genome Project announced in 2003 that it had mapped all our genes, it marked the start of a new chapter in the story of human evolution. Now, pioneering scientists are able to figure out how to change the very content of our genes. When a highly unusual mutation appeared in Central America, it presented geneticists with an enormous challenge. 41-year-old Jesus Aceves suffers from a condition known as hypertrichosis. It causes hair all over the face. The results of this rare genetic mutation have not been easy to live with. I felt bad and told myself, why was I born this way? Especially among so many so-called normal people, you know? Aceves is not the first one in his family to have the hypertrichosis mutation. His grandmother carried it too. She didn't have a hair-covered face, but she had the gene. And she also had a bit of a moustache, you know. That's when it all started. Now up to 30 members of the family have excessive hair on the face. At the Keck School of Medicine in Los Angeles, Professor Pragna Patel uses data from the Human Genome Project to find the particular faulty gene that affects just this family. Hair is growing in places where we don't normally see hair. So clearly some signal has been disturbed that normally tells cells hair don't grow here. Studying hair growth in humans is a big challenge because the hair follicles are specified very early in development. Even the baby, you can kind of see that they are going to have it. Patel had been studying this condition for nearly a decade when the Human Genome Project was completed. The current approach for finding genes for rare conditions has been revolutionized because we completed the Genome Project. If a person is affected, we can tell what probability a child with the condition will have. Both boys and girls can suffer if the mutation is handed down. Aceves has three daughters, all of whom have hypertrichosis. It's really hard because they are discriminated against, they are bullied and are teased at school. The fact that the whole family has the condition helps Patel identify the mutant gene. What we did was we took DNA from the Mexican family and we pinpoint the cause to a single mutation. With the faulty gene identified, there's hope of a cure and possible prevention in the future. While hypertrichosis may be difficult to live with, it's not life-threatening. Elsewhere, identifying a faulty genetic mutation has saved lives. Far out in the North Atlantic Ocean sit the Faroe Islands. This windswept archipelago has become an unlikely frontier of genetic medicine. An invisible villain plagues the isolated community. Franz Jensen suffers from a rare genetic disease known as carnitine transporter deficiency, or CTD. Caused by a genetic mutation, CTD has taken a heavy toll on his family. This is my youngest brother, Edmund. He passed away from CTD in 2007. He was 21 years old. Uh, I, this is me. I got my diagnosis the day after my brother passed away. Carnitine helps the body make energy from fats in food. In people with CTD, this doesn't happen, leading to muscle weakness, fatigue, and heart disease. Untreated, it can be fatal. 
if I exert myself, I get tired easily. And sometimes, even though my head is clear and I, I want to work or do something, I, I, sometimes I can't even move. Elsewhere in the world, CTD is extremely rare. On the Faroes, one in 300 inhabitants have the condition. My mother was a carrier of the disease and my father was a carrier and I'm sick. My wife is a carrier also and so my daughter, she's also sick. The cause of these alarming statistics lies in the islanders' past. The Vikings arrived in the Faroes more than a thousand years ago. Since then, few came to or left the islands, and the people became isolated. It's one of the most genetically similar communities in the Northern Hemisphere. In this isolation, the faulty CTD gene was regularly passed on. CTD can be managed if it's diagnosed and treated properly. In 2006, the Faroese health authorities set up a genetic biobank to decode the DNA of every citizen and use the data for medical treatment and research. It is an uh, inherited disease, so in principle you, you use the genetics to see which kind of CDD mutation you have. But also you could uh, in the future screen for carrier status so people know if they have it uh, and you can work with it in that way. So far, samples have been taken from more than 30,000 islanders in an unprecedented attempt to record the genes of an entire population. Knowing what's hidden in our genes allows us to make important decisions. Choices that may end up affecting the future of human evolution. People are starting to use genetic testing to decide whether to have children or not based on those genes. And so in some populations, you actually see the rate of genetic disorders declining because they're using technology to decide whether to have children. Could choices like these halt the process of evolution that has been operating for billions of years? For four billion years, basically life worked according to what Darwin argued, which is you have natural selection and you have random mutation. What's happened over the last centuries, and particularly over the last 30 years, is we've completely changed the logic of evolution. Today, our understanding of genetics means we can actually intervene in the natural selection process and change the DNA of a whole family. Now, when we find a mutation that can't be cured, we can try to eliminate it. Carmen Niagu suffers from an inherited genetic condition called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease, or CMT. Charcot-Marie Tooth is a condition that affects your nerves, especially the ones in your extremities. There is no cure for it, there is no medication to keep it under control, there's nothing you can do. Carmen's father also suffered from this disease of the nervous system, which starts with the hands and feet and eventually affects the whole body. You end up not being able to walk like my father was. Um, you end up not being able to do common tasks like being able to eat on your own. When Carmen and husband Gabriel decided to start a family, they were keen to make sure that their own children were free of the disease. I didn't, didn't want my baby to go through anything remotely similar that my father went through. So they sought the advice of a geneticist. 
I explained that I'm looking into having a baby and I want to know what my odds are in having a healthy baby. And she explained to us that we have a 50% chance of having a, a baby with CMT regardless. To have a baby that didn't carry the CMT mutation, Carmen would have to get pregnant using IVF. About half her embryos would contain the faulty gene that causes CMT, and half would not. Using a process known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, medics could study Carmen's embryos in search of the faulty gene. Carmen wanted to undergo a procedure where all her embryos would be screened for the particular genetic disorder, which is CMT. These faulty genes have been passed on from one generation to the other. So technology is smart enough now to read off this faulty gene, whereby couples can now have the option of not transmitting the faulty gene onto their children without having the information of all the genes that we have on the human genome, screening for this particular mutation or such mutations would not be possible. So certainly having the human genome mapped out has been a revolution. Even then, it's a difficult task. Geneticists examined hundreds of thousands of points in the genome. They had to identify the particular mutation that causes CMT. Once Carmen and Gabriel had undergone IVF, their embryos were scanned for the mutation. The embryos undergo a biopsy of a few cells, between, typically between five and seven cells. And these cells that contain the DNA of the embryos is going to be tested for the particular genetic mutation for CMT. Using a cutting-edge technique, the medics were able to isolate the CMT mutation in a matter of days. Then they selected an embryo without it. The result is baby Lucas, a true child of the 21st century. The chances of baby Lucas existing were close to zero 50 years ago. But then humankind evolved, technology evolved, we became more open-minded, we see things differently, and this is, this is the outcome. What is certain is that the CMT mutation has been wiped out of Carmen's family DNA. Yeah. My father was an only child, so it never occurred in his family again, and I'm an only child as well. So this condition in my family is going to die with me. I haven't passed it on. Lucas is absolutely healthy, which is amazing because with these kind of genetic conditions, you can't stop it in any Curing way, it, yeah. but you can actually prevent it from ever occurring. So this is the future. We are going to be in a world where no more disease in the future. Interventions like this are removing genetic conditions from individual genomes much faster than evolution could have done. Screening of embryos for genetic disorders has become a reality. We have had women, for example, who are certainly focused on trying to eliminate the breast cancer gene from their gene pool. These choices are just part of modern day evolution. We have editing technologies. We can now edit genomes. We can select embryos. All of these things can still be seen as a part of a natural selection process. Is this new natural selection creating better offspring than nature did in the past? Today, our technology allows us to alter DNA. We can create changes that will be inherited by future generations. And if I look to the future and say, what will happen to us? If there are big changes, they're likely to be big changes that we create. That's sort of frightening because it means that no longer is our evolution a product of nature. It's now a product of engineering. It seems that controlling the evolution of genetic characteristics is within our grasp. We're going to see this period of discovery continue through the next few decades. This understanding is going to provide us with um, many new ways to modify our health. In 2016, Great Britain officially became the first country to allow scientists genetically to modify human embryos in the laboratory. Some believe gene editing could mark the beginning of a whole new era of human evolution. 
When you talk about embryo selection, you are actually talking about babies that were actually produced in the, in the usual way. It's just that you pick the best one. This is different. Once you start editing, then all bets are off. Then you could just go in and instead of uh, picking the baby with the most pluses, you could just say, let's give the baby all pluses. And then the potential for producing something which is really off scale, really different from anything that came before, becomes much stronger. At the Beijing Genomic Institute, geneticists are in active pursuit of genes that can be edited into human embryos. In particular, they're hunting for genes that relate to intelligence. There's very good evidence that people who are exceptional, very exceptional in intelligence, that a big part of what gives them those abilities is some kind of unique genetic pattern. It's clear that it will have a huge impact on the future of the human race once this technology is available. While these scientists race to find the genes that will enhance our minds, others continue to figure out ways to improve the evolution of our bodies. Genetic understanding combined with modern medicine ensures we now survive diseases that at one time would have killed us increasing our chances of living well into old age. What happened over the 20th century is we doubled the average human lifespan. And a lot of that is due to our understanding of genetics. Throughout most of our evolutionary story, few lived longer than two or three decades. Today, as many as a third of babies born in the developed world will live well beyond 100. Now the race is on to work out how to keep their bodies healthy for most of their lives. Some of these Chinese gymnasts are more than 80 years old. Their extraordinary feats beg the question, why did human evolution enable some bodies to age well, while others do not? Again, the answer is hidden in our genes. Nobel Prize winning molecular biologist Carol Greider studies DNA to find out why some people age better than others. We're very interested in understanding age-related degenerative diseases, and so we're very fascinated to find out um, what are the new things that we can find that play a role in some of these diseases. Greider studies chromosomes, thread-like structures that contain all of our genes. The ends of the chromosome threads are protected by structures known as telomeres. It's very much like uh, the plastic tip on the end of a, of a shoelace. And if you don't have that, then it becomes unraveled. Our bodies grow and change thanks to constant cell division. But each time our cells divide, the telomeres get shorter and the chromosome threads start to unravel, making us vulnerable to disease. The fact that the cells are dividing so many times and the telomeres get short, that occurs throughout a person's lifespan as that person ages. And then at older ages, you're more susceptible to these age-related diseases because the telomeres are short. There are diseases like bone marrow failure. Uh, there's also liver disease and a lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis, that when telomeres are very short, these diseases occur. What we would uh, hope to find is something which can elongate the telomeres. The crucial importance of keeping telomeres long is illustrated by people whose bodies are unable to do so. Inoue Saki is just 49 years old. He has a condition known as Werner syndrome, which means that his body is unable to maintain telomere length when his cells divide. Since he was first diagnosed 10 years ago, his face has altered beyond recognition. Short telomeres and DNA damage have robbed Inoue of his hair and youthful skin. 
They also leave him prone to cancer and atherosclerosis. I would say that for people like me who suffer from Werner syndrome, it's like being on a super express train. And what I'm trying to do is slow it down as much as I can. It's an extreme example of what's happening in all of us. The human body has evolved to preserve the length of telomeres during cell division with an enzyme called telomerase. Molecular biologists are figuring out how to create this in the lab and inject it into defective cells. In the cells, there's very little telomerase. So we decided that a boost of telomerase activity for a short period might lengthen the telomeres. We were surprised by how well it does. It's like pushing the gas pedal on the car. That's how we're using the telomere like to understand who is at risk for disease. If you change the telomeres, then you're going to be able to help the people with those diseases to not get disease. So you will change their lifespan, those individual people, they will live longer. <laughs> as we begin to understand our genetics, as we begin to understand telomeres, as we begin to understand different parts of the aging process, we'll still continue to die, but hopefully take our bodies back to younger states. Medics are not only looking at genetics to keep our bodies fit and youthful. They're also studying them to invent new techniques to build whole new organs. Advances in tissue engineering and molecular biology could ultimately enable us to build future humans. As we live longer, scientists hope to bypass the aging process by replacing worn-out body parts. It's a field known as regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is really trying to harness the ability of the body to heal itself. The challenge is what happens when the body does not regenerate because of disease or injury. Organ transplantation is nothing new. For centuries, medics have been searching for ways to successfully move organs from one body to another. The quest continued throughout the 20th century. Doctors carried out the first successful kidney transplant in the 1950s. But six decades later, long waiting lists and organ rejection mean many still die. Recent advances in stem cell technology could make established organ transplantation redundant. Biologists once believed that stem cells found in embryos were the only cells that could turn themselves to any function required by the body. Now they can take adult cells and re-engineer them in the laboratory to make stem cells. These can then be used to make many of the body's specialized cells. This is the basis of regenerative medicine and another bold move in the evolution of us. Pioneers in the field are using stem cell technology to figure out how to grow organs from your own body. The current challenge right now is to create tissues and organs using your very own cells so that we can create organs on demand and without rejection. We're now beginning to develop instruments where we can change more and more of our body parts because each of our cells contains our entire genetic code. And, and we're now learning how to make those body parts. The reality of rebuilding a human body with tissues generated from its own cells is a distant one, but it's well underway. And when it arrives, it will radically alter future generations of humans.
For more than a decade, scientists have been able to turn stem cells into beating heart cells in the laboratory. Dr. Harold Ott is now working on building a customized human heart. What we try to do is we try to engineer functional organs for transplantation if we can sort of create tailor-made organs, so um, personalized organs on demand, you could see you undergoing many, many replacement procedures in order to extend your life expectancy. The bioengineers start with the scaffold that nature provides, taking a heart from a donor or animal. Then they flush all the cells and genetic material out of it. What that process entails is detergent solutions that wash out all the cells. You end up with an, uh, a framework of the organ amongst those hearts, lungs, and kidneys. Then stem cells are taken from the recipient and grown onto the heart scaffold to create a fully functioning new heart that carries the patient's own DNA. The hope is that organs grown in the laboratory like this can be transplanted without rejection. Ideally, you'd be walking into the hospital in need for a kidney, and doctors would take a cell biopsy, a tissue biopsy from you, and then create the necessary regenerative cells from that tissue biopsy. So in the end, that won't be rejected. In this kind of medical emergency, speed is an issue. So surgeon Anthony Atala is using a 3D printer to build a transplantable organ. Instead of laying the cells down by hand one layer at a time, you do it with a printer one layer at a time. But instead of using ink, you're using cells. This way, organs can be made to order. And perhaps a laboratory-built human could be within sight. I think it's a very bright future, and I think ultimately it will lead to new treatments and revolutionized medicine. The human body has traveled a long way in the past four million years, since the first humans walked the Earth. No one knows where evolution will take us next. Perhaps with enough scientific progress, humans might one day live forever.